For at TV, the world is thinking. I want to read a part from the second half of the book um, where, as I said, I'm going through his, uh, his impact and how he was thought about, how he was received, how he was interpreted. And this bit comes from toward the end of his life when his music wasn't just technically impressive anymore, but it it had it had taken on uh, it had become more more simple and and taken on almost folkish elements, and the power of his group was such that um, routinely people would describe performances by the Coltrane Quartet as sort of tension building until there was an explosion. And it wasn't quite like anything in jazz that had happened before. It wasn't like Charlie Parker. It wasn't like Count Basie. It was a, a whole new uh, feeling in the music, a whole new sound uh, that dislodged a whole new emotional response. And his music began to be understood as something much greater than just music. He began to be seen as sort of a, almost a, a, a philosopher or a kind of a trustworthy guide. Uh, and the claims, this was when the mythification of Coltrane started, and the claims on behalf of his music were so high that for certain enthusiasts who included not just fans but critics, you know, and, and other musicians. Um, certain enthusiasts of Coltrane's music really felt that he could do no wrong after a point because it wasn't really about his music anymore. It wasn't really about a certain recording or a certain uh, concert. It was the general idea of the thing that was so impressive to these people. So here's a couple, of, I, I quote from a couple of reviews to, to uh, illustrate what I'm saying here. One comes from uh, Downbeat magazine, which was the sort of main jazz magazine. It still is. From the spring of 1966, it's a, it's a part of a review of the record Ascension. And the first sentence is, this is possibly the most powerful human sound ever recorded. This is a critic, you know. Um, there's another one uh, from another magazine um, that begins also 1966. It's a, it's a review of a different recording called Live at the Village Vanguard Again. Its first sentence is, this recording just might be the greatest work of art ever produced in this country. And it goes on to say, I sometimes suspect that criticism of the conventional type has been obsolesced by this new music, which is why I have become so reluctant to write reviews in a strictly musical frame of reference. It seems to me that what these men and women are showing us is the heights to which the human spirit can soar when selfish egotism is subordinated to the goal of a common good. Hence, by implication, their statements pose a critique of capitalist society, which puts supreme emphasis on acquisitiveness and disregard for the welfare of one's fellow man. This is a review of a jazz record. Here's one other. And this is from a, from a, from a writer named Don DeMichael, who... Uh, Initially, who liked Coltrane, uh, who liked Coltrane's early music and wrote some sort of important articles about him, uh, and then was hesitant about the freer and wilder and more chaotic direction that his music was, taken, was taking. Um, this is sort of, this is a, a record review that kind of documents his conversion. It's a 1965 issue of Downbeat. It's a review of a record called Meditations. He talks about how he went to uh, a, a Coltrane show recently, and he says, the blast of sound almost bowled me over. It repelled me. I hated what they were playing, those drums and maracas and bells and tambourines. 
With all the clatter, I couldn't hear Jimmy Garrison's bass and sometimes couldn't hear Coltrane or Pharaoh Sanders, even though I was seated six feet away. I decided to go home, but had a couple of beers instead. Intermission. John came over and sat down. What was he trying to do in this music? Just trying to get it out, he said, making a scooping motion with his hands away from his chest. But what was all this, I said, pointing at the bandstand. He didn't know for sure. Things were not right with the music yet, he said, but he wants to get into rhythm more, and this is what, mi this is what might lead him to it. The next set, I heard it, experienced it, not what John talked about so much as what I was grappling with, why I was repelled, why I wanted to run. I do not pretend to understand this music. I doubt if anyone, including those playing it, really understands it in the sense that one un understands, say, the music of Bach or Billie Holiday. I feel this music, or rather, as I said, it opens up a part of myself that normally is tightly closed and seldom recognized feelings, emotions, thoughts well up from the opened door and sear my consciousness. So this is, this is the language of American transcendentalism and it's being very thickly applied to, to uh, understanding Coltrane's music at this point.